I hope that your week is going well and uh, and as we join tonight to uh, study that we will um, have a fruitful discussion tonight. Before we begin, uh, just a couple of things real quickly. Reminder about Vacation Bible School, uh, that's coming up and if any of the teachers, anybody if there's any questions or, or, or concerns, please let me know. Uh, we're going to start to really focusing attention. I am, at least in my mind, a lot on VBS. Uh, also, the fall gospel meeting, just as a way of reminder, my, my brother Tim Hall, my cousin, will be here with us October uh, the 9th through the 12th, so I'm really looking forward to that. So keep those things in your mind. Um, in regard to the bulletin, um, um, Doug was reminding me that we need to um, make sure we're getting those to him and to Florence, that we're letting them know so this stuff can get in the bulletin. If you pick up a bulletin, uh, you open it up, there on the below prayer request page is their email address. And so if you have a prayer request or, or some information you need to get to them, any kind of information, go ahead and do that um, during the week, and they'd love to hear from you, and, and that way they make sure um, they're getting the information they need uh, to put those things in there. So please keep that in mind, and if you're not picking up a bulletin, go ahead and start making that a regular habit um, for yourself. Uh, as we think about prayer requests, uh, we continue to remember... Uh, the brothers and sisters in Ukraine and, and that situation that goes on, even though maybe it's not as forward in our news as it was, uh, but that situation is still going on and we pray for our brothers and sisters there. Um, we also uh, need to continue to remember uh, Sandra and Jackie's son, John. Uh, he is, they're preparing to move him to a rehab center in Pittsburgh, so please pray for him. He still has not regain any kind of uh, feeling in his lower extremity. So please pray for, for them and, and for him. Um, good to see Miss Florence back and recovering. Uh, thank you all for your prayers for Baird as well and, and his recovery. He's feeling much better. He's getting in a lot of trouble now, so I know he's doing better. Uh, any other prayer requests? What about Archie? And was it your your brother and sister, sister and brother in law? They they're doing better too. So let's remember. I'll say thank you for all that. Anyone else? I got a friend that I went to school with in uh, Rutherford, in North Carolina, that uh, is having a second bout with uh, pneumonia in mm. about five or six weeks, and at first look time, it's really not her for a loop. Even though this time it's probably diagnosed a little faster and everything, she's still uh, mm -hmm. recovered from that. So her name is uh, Nancy Carson. Nancy, Nancy Carson. Carson. Remember her as well. Also, um, need to, of course, be praying for those families in Highland Park in that just tragic situation. I know that's um, that is very difficult. Also, um, um, Lisa was telling me about someone she knows. He was just 32 years old, just passed away from um, from complications caused from from COVID. So, very young man passing away. Yes, sir. Just a new life. Got some reasons to celebrate and also some prayers for uh, 
uh, for adjustment, a lot of adjustment. So we we'll definitely remember them. Is that it? All right. If you don't mind, let's bow. Almighty God and Father above, we are so grateful for your overwhelming generosity, for the love you shower upon us each day. Father, we plead with you for forgiveness. We know we don't deserve any of these things, and even beyond that, we have um, fallen in, in different ways and in our lives, and we need your mercy and your grace. Father, please help us to be the kind of example and light that we should be. Father, we pray for strength to face um, the temptations and trials in our life. Father, we pray that you will uh, bless us in, in our daily walk with you. Father, we're, we're mindful of all those we've mentioned tonight. We know there's numerous examples of, of concern that and anxiety that's on our heart. Uh, Father, we... We trust in you that, that you know uh, what's best for each of these situations, that, that you uh, can provide uh, the best help that any of these individuals and families could ask for. Father, we pray that you will be with these uh, individuals and families. and pray, Father, that you will uh, bless them and, and be with them. Father, uh, again, we thank you so much for allowing us to be a part of this family here. Father, for being able to join together in this study this evening. Father, please bless our discussion as we look at, uh, at your kingdom in, in Israel. Um, and Father, uh, we pray that we can learn from, uh, from, from your blessings, but also from the mistakes of those who've gone on before us. Father, we pray that uh, you'll continue to bless the work here, that uh, you'll continue to be generous with us. Father, um, you know, we know that the most important blessing that we've received is, is that of your son, of the sacrifice he, he laid down for all of us. Thank you, Father. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the f forgiveness that comes through his blood. We pray, Father, that, that, that you will continue to uh, uh, provide that for us in our daily walk. All this we ask in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. All right. So, um, as I mentioned before, we, uh, we are going back into our study. If you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 12, that's where we'll pick up this evening. In our last uh, study, last week, we, we looked at um, Solomon uh, and the end of his life, uh, where he took, takes a turn, not for the positive, but for the worse. Uh, he turns his heart away from God. He, he turned toward idolatry and, 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 and toward unfaithfulness toward the one who had blessed him so much. And, and of course, that has lasting effects both for Solomon uh, and for the Israelites. God raised up adversaries to give trouble for Solomon, but ultimately God made the decision to take the kingdom away from Solomon's son, or at least the majority of the kingdom. And as we get into tonight's study, we enter into this period of time when, when the kingdom of Israel is divided. And we'll look at those particulars as we move forward. Uh, you remember, uh, hopefully from our last study, how the prophet Ajaya uh, had, uh, had, um, had shown to Jeroboam that God was going to take away ten of the kingdoms of Israel and, and, uh, from Rehoboam sorry, and give them to Jeroboam. Well, we'll see that actually play out in our study tonight. And unfortunately, instead of being, um, you know, uh, a son of hope, a, a good king, Jeroboam actually goes um, in, into the same kind of uh, direction that Solomon went in uh, and even into maybe greater sin uh, in, in, a, in idolatry than even Solomon. So we'll, we'll note that as we move forward tonight. So if you will, um, let's go ahead and go to chapter 12. And let's start to break this down. So, as we get to verses 1 and 2, the text tells us Rehoboam. Now, Rehoboam is whom? 
Rehoboam is whom? All right, this is not starting off good. We got to get this question. <laughs> it's who? What? Who's Rehoboam? It's not. It's, it's not Judas. So it's, it's no, <laughs> it's Solomon's son. So he's Solomon's son. We noted at the end of our study last time, Solomon has now passed on. Um, he's died now. And now Rehoboam has become king. All right? So Rehoboam, son of Solomon. We'll get to Jeroboam, the guy in the north, in a minute. But uh, Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had, had come to Shechem to make him king. All right? So you, got the, you, you have the natural transition that, that's occurring. But some people have some concerns. Uh, he goes on to say, As soon as Jeroboam, uh, the son of uh, Nebat, heard of it, for he was still in Egypt. Now you remember, Jeroboam fled to Egypt. Why? Yeah, and even, even more so, Solomon tried to kill him. Right, when Solomon found out what the prophet had said, instead of saying, I, you know, I need to repent, I need to change my ways, he instead attacks Jeroboam. Right? So do we ever do that when we sin, we attack somebody else? We're deflecting, right? So he deflected on to Jeroboam. So Jeroboam flees to Egypt, and he's there until the time of Solomon's death. Uh, where he had fled from King Solomon, verse 2. Then Jeroboam returned to Egypt. So you got, in Shechem, you got everybody coming together. Right? And so they're going to anoint Rehoboam king. So at this point, there's no division uh, in, a, um, in a stated way. Now, you, I would argue the kingdom's already divided um, politically, socially, but as a, as a law, it's not. So they're, they're coming there to, to anoint Rehoboam king. Go on to verse 3. Then, uh, and they sent and called him, and Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and said to Rehoboam. So they all gathered together. They're there to make Rehoboam a king. So if you're Rehoboam, you think, well, everybody's coming to celebrate me, right? This is going to be a big, huge party. Well, it's not going to be the party he thought it was going to be. Notice what happens. Uh, your father made our yoke uh, heavy. When they say yoke, what do they mean? It's an old kind of language. We don't talk about yoke. Yeah. Now, I think it's interesting. Solomon did use slaves, but what, do you remember what was noted about that? Who did he use as slaves? Yeah, yeah. The, uh, the, the Hivites, the Amorites, those individuals who were there when the children of Israel came into the promised land, their descendants. But the text notes specifically that he did not use the Israelites at that point. Now, that what this may be indicating, now to my knowledge, there's no statement of this in Scripture, but this may be indicating that in his later years, he began to then bring in other actual Israelites into hard labor. Don't know. But it's similar language to what? The time in Egypt when Pharaoh made the yoke hard on the, on the people of God. Well, so whatever's happened... Uh, Whatever is meant by that, uh, they, they feel the weight of it, and they're complaining about it. Now, therefore, lighten the hard service of your father and his heavy yoke on us, and we will serve you. He said to them, go away for three days and come again to me. So the people went away. So you've got uh, kind of a challenging situation. His first uh, dilemma is king. Uh, you know, when, uh, when somebody's elected to an office, you know, normally you have a little bit of a honeymoon period, right? When everybody loves you and everything's going great. 
and then things get hard. Well, sometimes when you come into office or you get a new job, ever, anybody ever been hired and then like the first day on the job you get a hard question or problem to deal with? You ever, anybody ever had to deal with a situation like that? Roger has, right? You, you've had... That's not a fun way to begin your career or your job, is it? <laughs> You'd like to have a little bit of a period to adjust, to get to know your... You, you know, the other employees, your, your co-workers. That didn't always happen. So Rehoboam, he's king, and the first day, they're like, well, we got a problem we need you to solve. And so, um, and so he says, go away, three days, come back, and, and I'll give you an answer. So that, that seems like a pretty good plan, doesn't it? A good way to kind of deal with this. Let, let's let me let me have a couple days to kind of figure this out. I can't, you know, in my mind. I'm drawn to Acts chapter six. Do you remember Acts chapter six? What's going on at the beginning of that chapter? Do you remember? Anybody crawl back to your mind? Acts chapter six. Yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, that's exactly right. So you got the Grecian or Hellenistic widows are, are being missed in the daily distribution of food. And so the, the Hellenistic Christians or Grecian Christians, they come to the apostles and say, hey, our people are getting missed. Now, it is interesting, like Doug points out, the apostles' response to that is what? This needs to be done, but we, need, we don't need to be distracted from Yeah, so, so therefore, pick seven men from among yourselves to take care of this. What are they doing? All, all good bosses know how to do this, right? Delegate. You've got to be able to delegate. Um, this is a problem Moses has, wasn't it? Remember when, uh, when he goes and he's got a lot of people coming to him and he's hearing a lot of complaining. And he's just weighed down. He goes and he's, he's unloading to Jethro, his father-in-law. What's Jethro's advice? You're carrying too much? Can't keep it up. What's he doing? He's micromanaging. He wants to do it all. Now, if you're, if you're at all a control freak, delegation is not easy for you. And I understand. Uh, when I'm given a task, I have trouble delegating. I like to do it a certain way. And if I start handing it out, somebody may not do it the way I want it done. And I have a big problem with that. But when you let somebody else help you, what does that obligate you to? <laughs> you got to let them do it. Right, and you can't come behind them nitpicking and say, well, that's micromanaging as well. So Jethro's point to Moses was, you can't do it all yourself. You need to get people, you need to delegate some of this out to other people. Well, Moses does that, and it works really well. That's what the apostles do, isn't it, in Acts chapter 6. They say, go choose six, seven men, I'm sorry, seven men from among you. Stephen's one of those. Philip, the evangelist, is one of those. And... And put them over this task. They'll deal with it. Because the apostles say, hey, we have a job over here, and so I can't do that job and this job. Um, this becomes a big issue with eldership sometimes. I know I've made this joke before, and it's an old man joke, but it's, uh, you, you, in, in churches you have preachers doing the elder's job, the elders doing the deacon's job and the deacons twiddling their thumbs in the foyer wondering what we're supposed to do. What's the problem there? We're not communicating well. Yeah, you've got micromanaging going on there. You've got others not taking... It's a big mess, isn't it? God laid things out a certain way to delegate power, to delegate responsibility. And so you got Rehoboam, so he's got a problem. He's got to deal with it, just kind of like all these other situations we've mentioned. 
and he's got to figure out how to deal with it. Well, let's see how he does it, and let's see if maybe, does he do it the right way, or uh, could he have done it a better way? Let's go on and read just a little bit more. So he says, go away three days, come back in three days, and, and we'll, we'll hash this out. If you go down to verse uh, 6, uh, Rehoboam took counsel with the old men. That sound like a good idea? Does that sound like a good idea? You can do this or not. Just don't do this. All right. Yeah, it sounds like a good idea, right? Why would you want to go to older men? Experience. Experience. They've been there. They've dealt with stuff like this before. Listen to them. you got experience. You, you've got, hopefully, wisdom and understanding that maybe Rehoboam doesn't. He's a young man. He has a, doesn't have a lot of life experience. And so he goes and he takes counsel. Now, what, what kind of counsel do they, uh, do they give him? You go down to verse 7. They say, if you will be a servant to this people today. Now, notice that terminology. If you, Rehoboam, as king, be what? Servant to them... You know, what does Jesus say? He who wants to be first, let him... He who wants to be first in the kingdom, what? Be last. Be last. What's Jesus' point there? Yes, Leaders in the church don't stand out and be like uh, county supervisors, you know, watching the men blacktop. And you got... Uh, it always makes me laugh sometimes in government... You have a pothole, and you've got ten guys out there around staring around it. One one poor guy sitting there doing all the shoveling or the, you know, the whatever's got to be done. But we've all seen it, and you've all heard the jokes. But the point in the church, and for even the king of Israel, was you want to be a good leader. You want to be a good king. Learn how to serve. Danny Thomas, the um, founder of Wendy's, uh, I remember reading a story about him one time. Uh, he made all of his managers uh, learn how to mop and to do those kind of manual labors. Why did he do that? They could relate to all their employees. Yeah. And not to stand above them, to experience what life is like for them. And so, and so they say, if you will be a servant, verse 7, to this people today and serve them and speak good words to them when you answer them, then they will be your servants forever. Now, does that sound like good advice? Kind of all the reasons we've already said. I think that sounds like great advice. So... Rehoboam goes back and says, okay, how can I serve you? Is that what happens? Is that what happens? What would you say, Neil? Yeah, notice verse 8. He abandoned the counsel of the old men. <laughs> you ever get advice sometimes you don't really like? <laughs> and you just stop listening. I have seen it in my child's eyes when they come to me with an issue or a problem and I know they're no longer listening to me. You ever done that with a child or grandchild, right? A kid at school or in VBS or something and you're trying to help them and as soon as you start to explain it, they're somewhere else. Anybody ever done that? Am I the only one? I have seen it. And, and we, that's one thing for a child. We expect that kind of immaturity out of a child. But do we ever do that? I've done it. I've asked for advice. And as soon as somebody started saying something I didn't really want to hear, I didn't want to do it that way, I shut down. I'm not listening anymore. Sometimes it is, right? You just kind of like zone out. Okay, I've heard this before. You ever, do you ever discern, use discernment and who you go to ask advice from? You ever, well, <laughs> I could go down there. 
may not necessarily like what they have to say, but you know they give you an honor. Most of the time, yes. people think more like us, and so they'll give us an answer that may be more compatible with what we want to do. So we got a predisposition to what we want to do, and I know that person counsel me that way instead of somebody who really gives us a straight answer. We don't necessarily want that in and then later, after we've done that, we can say, I went and got advice. But, I mean, have you ever decided in your mind ahead of time, you knew how you wanted it done, but you just felt the need to go and ask somebody, but you knew if you ask that person, they're going to give me something else. I don't need that. I need to go over here and have my opinion reaffirmed. I mean... What do we call that in politics? Our echo chamber? We all have echo chambers, by the way. And it's, it's okay as long as you don't live in your echo chamber. You need to be willing to kind of risk being told a different set of advice, don't you? Over, over in Iraq during the war, we call that Baghdad and Bob. <laughs> yeah, well, I... Well, I could say one thing. It was really funny. I, I have to say this, and I'm not trying to be political. I just think the situation was funny. Back in 2020, when all the rioting was going on, there was watching a news reporter who was, who was standing out on the street giving a, a report. Behind him, a building is burning. And he says to the audience, it's been a mostly peaceful protest. Now, whether you agree with the protesting or not, that is, doesn't one stand in, front, in face of the other one? Right? So it's important to seek out good advice, not just what we want to hear. But what does Rehoboam do? Let's go on. I don't mean to continue to belabor the point, but it's, that image is ingrained in my brain, and I laugh, chuckle every time I see it. Not at the destruction, that's awful, but just at the, the, the cognitive dissidence going on there. I love that word, dissidence. I'm going to start using that a lot more. Um, so let's go back to the text. So he abandoned the council, verse 8. Uh, that the old men uh, gave him and took counsel where? With the young men, notice, who had grown up with him and stood before him. Does he go out just to any group of younger men? His buddies. It's his buddies, right? His pals. This is kind of what we are talking about before. Isn't he going out? He's made his mind up. He just needs somebody to reaffirm it or to agree with him. He needs his yes men. Well, we've got a good position in the, I mean, just the king now. You know, he'll, he'll include us in the leadership somewhere, you know? Yeah. I can sort of set myself up for a good position by going along with him. And agreeing with him, right? Uh, the downfall of many a um, person has been uh, collecting the collection of yes men around them. In, uh, many a politician has fallen at the feet of many of his own yes men. And so he takes counsel. What's their counsel? Verse 9, uh, or sorry, uh, verse 10. Um, the young men who had grown up with him said to him, Thus speak to this people who had said to you, Your father made your yoke heavy, but you lighten it, uh, lighten it for us. That's what the people are asking for. Lighten the yoke. Um, thus you shall say to them, my little finger is thicker than my father's thighs. That's an old way of saying, I'm a bigger man than my father. He thought he was tough. I'll show you how tough I am. Um, the arrogant young man attitude. I'm a big guy. Uh, he goes on to say, um, and now, whereas my father laid on you a heavy yoke, I will, lay, I will add to your yoke. My father disciplined you with whips, but I will discipline you with scorpions. And you kind of get the imagery of what they're asking for. 
Good advice. You know, we need to think about this like, and, and how people, how we treat people, don't we? Do we ever, are we ever tempted, uh, you know, to make things harder on people? This can be really hard in a relation, marriage relationship when, when one person continues to kind of make life tougher and tougher for the other individual. Those relationships aren't, aren't very stable, are they? They're not going to last very long if you continue to do that. You're going to wear the other person out. When you're continually asking for more and more. You know, I, I learned this a long time ago, and I think it's very true. Um, I was talking about marriage with one of my friends, and we were talking about, you know, the thing about life, all of us fit into one of these two categories, and, and, and we may at different times be, be in either or. But life is made up, relationships are always made up of givers and takers. And, you know, all of us fit somewhere in those categories, and it may change over time. I'm not saying we're hard and fast there, but, but we were talking about it, and, you know, I was sitting there thinking about relationships. A relationship with two givers is going to be a good relationship. It'll, it'll have solid footing because you always have one person, or I'm sorry, you always have both people putting into the relationship. A giver and a taker in a relationship may last for a little while, but what eventually happens? The giver gets empty. And they don't want to put any more into it. And that's going to be spell real trouble for that relationship. And a relationship with two takers, it ain't going to last any time. Because if all you ever do is take out of the relationship, if you're always going into the relationship bank and you're always making withdrawal, 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 it ain't, it ain't going to be good. A good, strong relationship is about people who give, who add, not just take. Now, there's nothing wrong with, at times, you know, taking a withdrawal. But be careful. That can get very, it can put you in a very greedy place where you want to keep coming back. So we all need to continue to consider, am I a giver or am I a taker? What am I giving here? And if I'm not giving, it's not like I can't change. If I'm a taker, it's not like I can't change. But I do need to consider that and, and, and how dedicated I am. It's the same thing with God, isn't it? In our Christian relationship. Why are you Christian? We talked about it in our sermon a couple weeks ago. Why are you a child of God? Why are you here? Your why is important. If you're only here to take from God, it's only about what God can give you there's going to be a point where that isn't going to be enough. And when times get hard, if that's all you're looking for, then you're going to fall away. It's about being a symbiotic relationship where I'm, I'm giving as well as taking. And, and so I think that's important. And with these young men, they're all young men. They haven't matured. They don't understand this. And so what are they looking for? They just want to take. Let's just keep draining the tank. And it's going to cause problems. So let, let's go on. Um, so verse 12 in our text. He, after three days, Jeroboam, all the people come to Rehoboam for his answer. The king said... Come to me again the third day. So that, that's what they do. Verse 13. And the king answered the people harshly. You know, that old saying about you can catch a lot more, um, uh, what well, has it go? A lot more, um, it's not bees with honey. What is it? How's it? Flies. It is flies. Okay. Catch a lot more flies with honey. That's kind of a disgusting. I want to change that. I can catch a lot more uh, bears with honey than I can vinegar. Right? I just don't want uh, flies are disgusting. Um, but I can, you know, you, you're, 
how you say things does matter. And let's think about that with how we talk to our children and our spouse. How you say it does matter. How we talk as brothers and sisters, it matters. But he speaks very harshly. And so, he, uh, he forsaking the counsel of the old men uh, the, uh, that the old men had given him, he spoke to them according to the counsel of young men. And so he goes on to say, I'm going to make it hard on you. I'm going to, I'm going to increase the weight of the burden you bear. I'm going to discipline you not with whips, but with scorpions. I mean, for the Israelites, this has to bring mind Egypt. God brought us out of Egypt to deliver us to, to you? To you? What's Rehoboam's biggest problem here? What do you think his biggest problem is? What? Pride. 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 He thinks more of himself than he, do, than, he, than he really is. He believes he has more power than he has. Who has the real power here? Rehoboam, one man, or the people, the many? Huh? Yeah, and yeah, and, and he just really, he has a misunderstanding of what's going on. If you go on to verse 15, you see it. Uh, verse 15, the king did not listen to the people, for it was a turn of affairs, what? Brought about by the Lord. Now, so we know what the prophet said to Jeroboam. But did God... It's interesting how God did this. Was this miraculous what happened? God said, I'm taking away the kingdom from you. But what you notice, God is casting a judgment. But how does he fulfill that judgment? How does, how does he pursue that judgment? Not in a miraculous way, does he? Yeah. And really, in casting, exactly, in casting the judgment, the prophet is being prophetic. I just think it's interesting that God didn't... Did God turn their minds and make them do this? He knew the air. Yeah, exactly. He knew the arrogance of Rehoboam. He knew what Rehoboam would do. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, we often draw attention to the miraculous in the Word. Like, when we, when we see God casting judgment directly. So you think about uh, um, uh, uh, Nahab and Abihu. When God sent fire and he, he, he killed them right there. Or maybe you think about uh, Korah where God opened up the earth. Or you think about when God sent serpents among the people. Or maybe you think about Acts chapter 5, when God killed uh, directly um, uh, Ananias and Sapphira, right? And, and God does judge people that way. Or maybe you think about Sodom and Gomorrah. But is that how God cast out His judgment most often? No. God does it in a, uh, in a different way, in a, um, not in a miraculous way, but in a providential way. So God puts things around us 
that will execute His judgments. I think about Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 is about the government. And he, Paul says, let us be subject to the governing authorities. Why? Does he remember why he says that? Romans chapter 13. So God put them in place. And why does He put them into place? He goes on to explain why. In verses 1 through 6. You can cheat and go to Romans 13 if you want to. Why? That's not cheating. But why does God put, put those people in place? To provide them. So it gives order to any people. Um, it provides, you know, it's a way to provide leadership. But it also provides a way of judgment. I, I like what Paul says in the book of Acts. And i got to remember the chapter. I think, it's, um, I think it's chapter 26. When he appeals to Caesar... Paul says in doing that, he says, you know, if I've done anything wrong deserving of death, I will go and I will die. Now, of course, Paul hasn't done anything deserving of death, but he, he, he says to them, I, I will face my punishment, whatever it is. You don't have to worry about me running away. I'm not going to do that. Because he knew he was subject to the governing authority. God's using those governing authorities to, to be there as judgment of the people when they err. That's one of the ways God places judgment. What about our parents? Or you as a parent? You're a form, you're the hand of God in disciplining your children. Now, anytime people are involved, what is, what is possible? Sin, going too far, uh, misdirecting your judgment. Those things are all possible. But, but I think at the same time we can't forget that those, those things are there as, as the way, if, especially if they're done the way God organized them, as a way to discipline us, to bring us discipline and judgment when we need it. So uh, here is Rehoboam. He acts very foolishly and, of course, heirs, which will lead to the division of the kingdom um, I think it's interesting in verse 16 as we bring this to a close. When all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, what was their answer? We have no portion, or, or sorry, what portion do we have in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. To, to your tents, O Israel, look now to your own house, David. So Israel went to their tents. And so you really have at this point this moment when, when the kingdom divides, it splits uh, in, in a very real way. There's a division that cannot be healed. And Rehoboam lays at his feet in a great way, in his pride. Pride goes before destruction, a haughty spirit before a fall. I think that Solomon, if he'd read his father's own writings, maybe he would have understood more about this. Well, we will dismiss and rejoin for our devotional in just a couple of minutes. Thank you.